If a man dies, shall he live again? What does it mean to be absent from the body and present with the Lord? Did Jesus go with a thief to paradise on Good Friday? Did the souls of dead people really cry out from below the altar? Pastor Bohr answers these questions and more in the amazing series So bow our heads for prayer. Our Father and our God, what a joy it is once again to be in your presence. We're thankful, Father, for your holy word, which is a sure guide in a world that is so confused about many things. And Father, as we study one more topic on the subject of life and death, we ask for the guidance of your Holy Spirit. I ask, Lord, that you will remove all preconceived ideas from our minds and from our hearts, and that you will help us to understand the truth as it is in Jesus. And we thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. In our study today, we are going to take a look at a very complex passage of the Apostle Paul. Now, let me tell you something about the Apostle Paul. You know, there were two great pillars of the earliest church. One of them was Peter, and the other one was Paul. Now, Peter was a fisherman, down to earth. Most of what he wrote is easy to understand, although not everything, because our next lecture we're going to talk about preaching to the spirits in prison. But most of what he wrote could be grasped by the common, ordinary person in the pew. But the Apostle Paul was a philosopher, and he was a theologian, trained in the schools of the rabbis. And therefore, he wrote some things that are very complex and difficult to understand. Now, Peter, uh, in his second epistle, had this to say about the writings of the Apostle Paul. If you'll turn with me to chapter 3 and verses 15 and 16 uh, of the gospel, the second gospel of Peter. You we're going to see what Peter had to say about Paul. It says there, An account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, that is, about salvation, in which are some things hard to understand. So you would say, Paul, why didn't you make yourself clear? But Peter doesn't blame Paul. He continues saying, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction as they do also the rest of the Scriptures. So Peter doesn't blame Paul for being too complicated. He blames those who are untaught and unstable for twisting what the Apostle Paul really meant. Now we're going to study today a passage that has been greatly misunderstood by the Christian world. We're going to take a look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verses 1 to 10. This is the famous passage where the Apostle Paul speaks about his desire to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. And some Christians say, clear as day, that the Apostle Paul wanted to die and he wanted his soul to fly off to heaven so that his soul could be immediately upon death with the Lord. That is the way in which this passage is interpreted by most Christians. The question is, did the Apostle Paul mean to teach this? First of all, we want to take a look at the context, the immediately preceding context. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verses 16 through 18, and I want you to notice that the Apostle Paul is contrasting our present existence on this, in this world with our future existence in heaven when Jesus comes. Here the Apostle Paul makes a series of contrasts between the here and now and the sweet by and by, if you please. 
beginning with verse 16. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, by the way, that's our body as we know it now, yet the inward man, that is our spiritual nature, is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, that's now, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Do you see the two things that he's comparing? He's comparing our light affliction now with the exceeding and eternal weight of glory when Jesus comes. Verse 18, while we do not look at the things which are seen, that's the here and now, but at the things which are not seen, those are the things of heaven. For the things which are seen are temporary. In other words, this world is going to pass. But the things which are not seen are eternal. Those are the heavenly things. So the Apostle Paul, in the immediately preceding context, is contrasting this life which has affliction, this life which is temporal, with the future life where we will experience joy and where we will live eternally with the Lord. Now with this context, we want to take a look at the passage that we're going to especially study today. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 1. Here the Apostle Paul says, For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is dissolved, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Now notice that the Apostle Paul is contrasting the tent that we live in now with a building that God has reserved for us later. Now there's some important terminology in this verse. The first term is the word tent. The King James Version translates it tabernacle, but the New King James calls it a tent. The tent represents the transitory body, corruptible mortal body that we live in now, which upon the moment of death is dissolved. But then you'll notice that the Apostle Paul speaks about a building that God has reserved for us in heaven. By the way, the word building is in contrast to tent. The word tent is skenoo in Greek. The word building, the building that God has for us in heaven is the word oikoterion. It's not a tent. It is a permanent, solid building with foundations. So what the Apostle Paul is contrasting here is our present earthly house that we live in, which we're going to notice is our body, which is a tent, corruptible, which can be dissolved with the building that God has prepared for us in heaven, our immortal and incorruptible body that will last throughout eternity. Now it's important to realize in this verse that the Apostle Paul says that we already have that building in heaven. He doesn't say we will have that building. He says we have a building now. In other words, if you believe that the soul of man is immortal and that the soul of man is a building, then there are two entities to man. There's the soul, which is a building, and then God also has a building prepared in heaven. You would have two buildings. The fact is that the Apostle Paul is telling us here, he's contrasting our earthly body with the incorruptible, immortal body that we will have when Jesus comes. Now let's take a look at the word tent that is used here. You know that a tent is very transitory, right? It's not permanent. It can dissolve and corrupt very easily. 
Let's turn in our Bibles to Job chapter 4 and verse 19 to see what our present house is. It says there in Job 4 and verse 19, How much more those who dwell in houses of clay, whose foundation is in the dust, who are crushed before a moth, what do we live in now? We live in houses of what? Houses of clay, composed of dust. What happens in the course of time with clay? It breaks, it's brittle, like a tent, it dissolves. Notice also Job chapter 10 and verse 9. Job chapter 10 and verse 9. Here Job says, Remember, I pray, that you have made me like clay, and you will turn me into dust again. So what is the house that we live in now? You'll notice that the Apostle Paul uses the terminology earthly house, this tent. Job speaks about our earthly house made of what? Of clay. It is fragile, it is breakable, and it can be dissolved. But the Apostle Paul is saying that the building that God has for us in heaven is eternal, permanent, and it cannot be dissolved. Now let's read a passage from the writings of the Apostle Peter where he speaks about the tent and the building. Not at 2 Peter chapter 1 and verses 13 through 15. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verses 13 through 15. Here the Apostle Peter says this, Yes, I think it is right, as long as I am in this tent, what does he mean by as long as I am in this tent? He's saying as long as I am in this present corruptible mortal body, so he says, yes, I think it is right as long as I am in this tent to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent. What does he mean by putting off his tent? It means that the tent is going to dissolve. The house of clay is going to disintegrate, in other words. He continues saying, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me, Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. By the way, that word decease is the same one that's used in Luke 9, verse 31, where Jesus spoke about him with Moses and Elijah about himself going to Jerusalem to experience his decease, which is speaking about what? It's speaking about death. So the question is, when is Peter going to lay off this present corruptible, dissolvable tent? It's going to be at the moment of his what? Of his decease. That when he, that's when he lays off his tent. Now you notice that the Apostle Paul says here that uh, we have a building in heaven which is made without hands. What does that mean, a building made without hands? Well, let's turn in our Bibles to Mark chapter 14 and verse 58. Mark 14 and verse 58. Here, uh, the enemies of Jesus are accusing him of saying something, and they're using it against him to condemn him to death. It says, Mark 14, verse 58, actually, Jesus has said that uh, he's going to resurrect the third day, and so they say, secure the tomb, so that uh, the third day they can't come and steal his body, and uh, then say that he actually resurrected. Notice, we heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, so his temple was made with what? hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. They say that's what Jesus said. And so we better guard the tomb to make sure that they don't steal the body, and then they say that Jesus resurrected. By the way, what did Jesus mean 
when he said, destroy this temple, what was he talking about? If you read John chapter 2, verses 19 to 21, it says that he was speaking about the temple of his body. He was speaking about the temple of his body. In other words, the temple made with hands was the body of Jesus that went into the grave. Are you with me or not? What was the temple that was made without hands? It was actually the glorified, immortal, incorruptible body that Jesus received at the moment of His what? At the moment of His resurrection. So you'll notice Jesus says, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Destroy this temple made with hands, and in three days I will raise it up a temple not made with hands. He's contrasting His present corruptible mortal body with the body which is immortal and incorruptible that He re would receive after His resurrection. Now let's notice another text that speaks about uh, not made with hands and what it means. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 11. It's speaking here about the sanctuary. And the earthly sanctuary was a copy of the heavenly one. The earthly one was made with hands, but the heavenly one was made without hands. That is because God made it. Notice Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 11. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come, with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, by the way, this is the heavenly temple, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. Are you understanding what this is saying? In heaven there is a temple that's not made with human hands because it was made by God's hands. On earth there was an earthly sanctuary that was built by human hands. What is being contrasted is the present body of Jesus, mortal and corruptible, which comes as a result of being born from a human mother, and the body which His Father prepared for Him in heaven that He gave Jesus when Jesus resurrected from the dead. By the way, did Jesus have a real body before He died? Oh, that's, that's a ridiculous question. Of course, He got tired, He ate, He walked, He had flesh and blood. You can read it in the Gospels. He had a body before His death. Like what kind of body was that? Was it a body of clay, so to speak? Was it a tent that could be dissolved? Of course, He died. What kind of body did Jesus receive after His resurrection? Was it still a physical body? Yes. But it was a spiritual physical body, if you might say. In other words, it was a body that was incorruptible and immortal. It was not subject to being dissolved. Are you with me or not? Now let's read about that in Luke 24, verse 39. This is speaking about the post-resurrection body of Jesus. It says there, Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. So did Jesus have flesh and bones after His resurrection? Sure. What kind of building did Jesus have after His resurrection? It was not a tent. It was a building. It was not a skene. It was an oikoterion. In other words, a permanent, solid building. Kind of like in the wilderness, Israel uh, had a tent with them, which was the tabernacle. Later on, when they settled in the Promised Land, what did they build? They built a solid, permanent what? Temple. And so that's the contrast between a tent and a solid building which cannot be dissolved. It continues saying in verse uh, 41, But while they still did not believe for joy and marveled, he said to them, Have you any food here? So they gave him a piece of a boil, broiled fish and some honeycomb, and he took it and ate in their presence. So did Jesus eat food? like a normal person would with a body. Absolutely, yes. By the way, are God's people going to eat in heaven? Are they going to eat in the new earth? 
The Bible says we're going to eat from the tree of life. So we must have some type of digestive system. But it's going to be in an incorruptible, incorruptible and immortal body. Now, do you understand what the Apostle Paul is trying to say in verse 1? He's contrasting our present earthly tent, provisional, temporary, corruptible, can be easily dissolved with the building that God has prepared in heaven. Notice that the building exists as Paul is writing. The building, the permanent body, incorruptible, immortal, not temporal, not subject to being dissolved. That is the resurrection body, in other words. Now, let's go to verse 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 2. The Apostle Paul continues saying, for in this we groan. In other words, in this tent we what? We groan in this tent. Why do we groan? Earnestly desiring to be clothed, notice this, to be clothed with our habitation which is from where? From heaven. So why is the Apostle Paul groaning? Because he wants to be clothed upon by his habitation, which God has at that very moment, where? In heaven for him. Now the question is, is the Apostle Paul groaning here because he wants his immortal soul to leave his body and to go to heaven to be with the Lord? Absolutely not. Let's notice another parallel verse about what the Apostle Paul groaned about. Romans chapter 8 and verse 23. Romans chapter 8 and verse 23. The Apostle Paul is speaking here about the resurrection when Jesus comes. And he says this, not only that, but we also who have the first fruit of the Spirit, even we ourselves what? Groan, there's the same word, groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting. By the way, did he say earnestly desiring in 2 Corinthians 5? Yes, he says here, eagerly awaiting for our soul to fly off to heaven to be with the Lord. No, that's not what it says. Eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. What was the Apostle Paul groaning for? Did he want his soul to leave the body so he could be present with the Lord? No, he wanted to leave his tent here, corruptible, dissolvable, mortal, and he wanted God to give him his resurrected body, the body that is not subject to corru corruption, the building, the solid building that does not corrupt or dissolve. Are you with me? Now, let's notice 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 2, and let's go on to verse 3. The Apostle Paul is now going to introduce a third option. You see, the first option is the tent. No good. The second option is the building that God has for Paul at that very moment. But now the Apostle Paul presents a third option, a third possibility. He says here in verse 2, For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation which is from heaven. What is he groaning for? He wants to be clothed with the habitation or with the building that God has from heaven. Notice this, if indeed having been clothed, we shall not be found what? Naked. Now wait a minute. So there's a tent that we are clothed with, that's our present body, corruptible, dissolvable. There's the building that God has prepared at the time of the resurrection. But if for some reason we don't receive the building, and we lay aside our tent, what condition are we in? Naked, according to the Apostle Paul. By the way, in 1 Thessalonians 4, he calls it sleeping. And in other places, he calls it dead. They're all the same, the same uh, concept with different terminology. Now, the Apostle Paul then presents three options. The first is to be clothed with our present tabernacle. That's our present corruptible mortal body. The other is to be clothed upon with our heavenly building at the moment of the resurrection. The other option is not to be clothed at all with the present body or with the future body. And he says that that means to be what? To be naked. 
In other places he says asleep, and in other places he says dead. Are you with me? Now let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 4. And I want you to notice four terms in this verse. For we who are in this tent, which tent? Our present corruptible mortal body. For we who are in this tent groan, remember that word, groan, being burdened. Is this body a burden? Most certainly is. Now notice this, not because we want to be unclothed. Does the Apostle Paul want to be unclothed? Does he want to be naked? Does he want to go and be present with the Lord without a body? Of course not. He says, for we who are in this tent, groan, that's the first word I want us to notice, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but what? Further clothed. Remember that, further clothed. That's number two. That mortality, that's number three, that mortality may be what? Swallowed up. That's number four. Swallowed up by life. Remember those terms. Grown, number two, further clothed. Number three, mortality, swallowed up. Now, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verses 50 to 55. 1 Corinthians 15 and verses 50 to 55. Here the Apostle Paul is speaking not about the soul leaving the body at the moment of death to go and be with the Lord. The Apostle Paul is here talking about the resurrection from the dead. And notice the terminology that he uses. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood, we've already discussed this, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit what? Incorruption. Is that the same thing as saying the tent and the building? The tent is the corruption. The building is what? Incorruption. Verse 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Now notice this. For this corruptible must put on. By the way, that's, that means to be clothed in the Greek. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. And this what? Remember that mortality was going to be swallowed up by life? Does that happen at the moment of death or at the moment of the resurrection? It says, for this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. So, when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is what? Remember this expression? Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? Question, what was the Apostle Paul groaning about? He wanted the redemption of his what? Of his body. When is it that the mortal is clothed with immortality? At the resurrection. When is it that death is swallowed up in victory? At the resurrection. The Apostle Paul must explain the Apostle Paul. In other words, we cannot just take our presuppositions from the 21st century and impose them upon Scripture. Now the question is, when is it that this takes place? That corruption is taken away and incorruption is given in its place. That more mortality is removed and immortality is given. Notice Philippians chapter 3, 20 and 21, where the Apostle Paul speaks about the building that God is going to give us and what that building is going to be like. By the way, it's the same type of building that Jesus got when He resurrected. Notice Philippians chapter 3, 20 and 21. Here the Apostle Paul says, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait, see the terminology again, eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Do we eagerly wait for Him to come and take us to heaven when we die? No. Notice, who will transform our lonely body, is that the tent? Is that the tent? 
the corruptible mortal, mortal tent? Yes. Who will transform our lowly body that it may be, may be conformed to His glorious body. Is that the building that God has in heaven? Absolutely. According to the working by which He is able even to subdue all things to Himself. By the way, that building is already assured in heaven. Do you know why? Because God has given us already the down payment through the Holy Spirit. Notice 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 5. This is not wishful thinking. We have the building because we have the Holy Spirit, who is the down payment or the security deposit, if you please. It says there, Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the Spirit as a what? As a guarantee. Better translation would be an earnest or a security deposit or a down payment. Notice 2 Corinthians 1, 21 and 22, speaking about this down payment again, being the Holy Spirit. It says there in 2 Corinthians 1, 21 and 22, Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who also has what? sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. So is this idea of receiving the heavenly building wishful thinking? No. We have the assurance in heaven because He has given us the Holy Spirit as the guarantee. Notice also Ephesians 1 verses 13 and 14. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. It says here, In whom you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were what? Sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of His glory. What guarantee do we have now that we're going to get the promised possession, that we're going to get the building in the future, and our body is going to be redeemed? God has given us in the present His what? His Spirit. By the way, Jesus resurrected the first fruits to show that there will be last fruits. The Holy Spirit is the guarantee, and the resurrection of Jesus is the guarantee, not some immortal soul. Notice 1 Corinthians 15, 17 to 23, the emphasis of the Apostle Paul on Jesus as the first fruits, and the fact that there will be last fruits, if you please, because Jesus lives, His people will live in the future. Notice 1 Corinthians 15, beginning with verse 17. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. Then also, those who have fallen asleep in Christ, let me ask you, are those the ones who are unclothed? Are those the ones who are naked, so to speak? Yes, because they don't have, they, they don't have their present mortal body, and they don't have their what? They don't have their immortal body. Did the Apostle Paul want to be naked? Because some people say, oh, it'd be nice to die, and then tonight I can be with the Lord. The fact is, the Apostle Paul says, well, I don't want to be unclothed. Because he knew that death was sleep. He wanted to go and be present with the Lord at the moment of the resurrection. He wanted to be alive. That's why he says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, he says, we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with those who died in Christ. Notice verse 18. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have what? Perished. If Jesus has not risen, then those who have died have what? In Christ? Perished. Are perished. Now wait a minute. I guess then they would have to get a return ticket for their soul from heaven. See, it doesn't make much sense. If in this life only, the Apostle Paul says, we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive, but each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ's at his coming. When is it that we're going to be with the Lord? At his coming. 
When is it that we're going to receive the building at His coming? If we should die, we lay off the tent. The tent dissolves. But we don't have to worry. We have the guarantee of the Holy Spirit. And when Jesus comes, He's going to give us that building that He's prepared for us. That immortal, incorruptible body. Are you all with me? Now, let's go also to Romans chapter 8 and verse 11. Speaking once again about the Spirit. If the Spirit that resurrected Jesus is, on, is in us, God is going to resurrect us as well, because the Holy Spirit is the down payment. Notice, but if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give to your mortal, mortal body life through His Spirit who dwells in you. So those who have the Spirit, do we have to fear death? Do we have to fear that our present earthly corruptible tent is going to dissolve? Absolutely not. Do we have to even fear at being naked, so to speak? Absolutely not. Because, because God has given us the Holy Spirit, we know that when Jesus comes, He's going to bring that building, and He's going to give us the building. He's going to give us the immortal, incorruptible body. And now we come to the verse which has been greatly misunderstood. We've set the stage for the verse that has been misunderstood. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verses 6 and 7. So, we are always confident, the Apostle Paul says, knowing that while we are at home in the body, which body? You tell me which body. While we are home, at home in the tent, while we're at home in this corruptible, weak, mortal, temporal body, we are what? He says, we are absent from the Lord. Are you understanding what it's saying? While we are present in the tent, we are what? We are absent from the Lord, the Apostle Paul says. Now, is the Apostle Paul saying that he wants to be absent from the body so he can be present from the Lord with the Lord immediately upon death? See, this is the way that Christians read in. They say, so we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. But, you see, when we lay down our body, immediately after death, our soul goes to heaven and is present with the Lord. Is that what the text says? No. The text simply says that while we live in our corruptible tent, at this moment, we are what? We are absent from the Lord. And then the Apostle Paul says in verse 7, For we walk by faith, not by what? Not by sight. Now, why would he include that parenthetical statement there? We walk by faith, not by sight. Let me ask you, do we have to believe by faith that someday Jesus is going to give us that incorruptible, immortal body? We're not up there. We're here. Right? And so we have to accept it how? By faith. How about when we get there? Will we have to accept it by faith anymore? No, because we will walk by what? We'll walk by sight. So the Apostle Paul is saying, now while we're in the tent, we have the promise of the building. It hasn't come yet. He says, so now we have to walk by faith. We have the down payment of the Holy Spirit, and we know that someday soon we're going to get the building because we have faith that God has promised and that He will fulfill His promise. He says, but when we get there, we're not going to walk by faith anymore because we'll be there. We'll have the building. So he says, then we will walk. We will walk how? We will walk by sight. By the way, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1 amplifies this thought. Hebrews 11 in verse 1 says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. What was the Apostle Paul hoping for? Well, he was hoping that he could die and fly off to heaven in his soul to be with the Lord, right? Of course not. What was he hoping for? 
He was hoping for the moment when Jesus would come to give him his immortal and incorruptible building. But did he have to accept that by faith? Faith is the substance of things that we what? We hope for. The evidence of things that we cannot yet what? See. So we walk by faith, not by sight. Are you following me? Now, let's go to Romans 8 verse 24. The Apostle Paul speaks about this hope, this hope that he eagerly waits for, which is the redemption of his body. Notice Romans 8 verse 24. For we were saved in this hope. But that, notice, but hope that is seen is not what? Is not hope. Let me ask you to say, oh, I hope someday to get to heaven if I'm already there. Why do I need hope? Are you with me? The Apostle Paul saying, for we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? In other words, if you already have your immortal, incorruptible building, you're not going to say, oh, I hope someday the Lord will give me my incorruptible, immortal building. We walk by faith, not by sight. But let me ask you, is our faith wishful thinking? Is faith like saying, oh, I hope so. I hope someday God is going to give me, uh, you know, the building. Absolutely not. We can be certain because God has given us the Spirit. We can be certain because Jesus is the fruit, first fruits. Jesus is alive. Our hope is not in flying off to heaven at the moment of death. The Apostle Paul's not saying that he wants to immediately when he dies, he wants to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. Notice 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 8. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 8. Let's read verse 7 again for the context. He says, so we are always confident. Knowing that while we are at home in the body, that is in this tent, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. By the way, that's in parentheses in most uh, Bibles. And then he continues his argument in verse 8. We are confident, yes, well pleased rather, that our immortal soul, soul be absent from the body immediately after death, and be present with the Lord immediately after death. That's the way it's read. Christians inject into the text the idea that's immediately after death, and that it's the soul that is absent from the body. The word soul is not used, and the word immediately is not used either. So when the Apostle Paul says, we are confident, yes, well, please, rather, to be absent from the body, what does he mean by absent from the body? He says, I want to I wanna get away from this corruptible, mortal, destructible, dissolvable tent. And I want to be present with the Lord, how? As an immortal soul? Or I want to be present with the Lord with the building that He has prepared for me, eternal, everlasting, incorruptible, immortal. Are you understanding what Paul is saying here? He's saying we are confident, yes, well pleased, rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Now the question is, when did the Apostle Paul expect the dead to be present with the Lord? We have to let Paul explain. Paul, notice 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verses 15 to 17. 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 15 through 17. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we also, who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord, will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And what? And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then... We who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. When is it that we're always going to be with the Lord? At the moment of death, or is that at the moment of the resurrection of the dead? The Apostle Paul makes it clear it's at the moment of the resurrection of the dead. Notice once again what the Apostle Paul had to say in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 to 55. I mean, it's so clear. How can you get away from this? 
Don't inject into the Bible your preconceived notions and ideas. Don't say, oh no, the Apostle Paul wanted to be absent from the body so that his soul could be present with the Lord. The word soul isn't there. Oh, he wanted to be absent from the body. The moment he died, immediately he wanted to be present with the Lord. The word soul and the word immediately is not there. So we need to know when Paul expected to be present with the Lord. Raise your hand if you're understanding what I'm saying. Praise the Lord. Now, 1 Corinthians 15, 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. That means the tent can't inherit the kingdom of God, right? Because it's corruptible. Nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Is he comparing the same two modes of existence that he does in 2 Corinthians 5? Absolutely. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Now, in other words, we're not all going to be naked. But we shall all be what? Changed. When will we receive our building from heaven? When is it that we're going to be changed? This tent is going to be changed to a building? It says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible. In other words, we're going to receive our building. And we shall be changed. For this corruptible, that is the tent, must put on incorruption, the building. And this mortal, the tent, must put on immortality, the building. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? So the Apostle Paul has presented three options. Option number one, to live presently in the tent, in our corruptible, mortal, temporal body that can dissolve. The second option is that when Jesus comes, we'll receive our building from heaven, and therefore we will be present with the Lord. The third option is in between for those who die in Christ. They will not be clothed with their tent, and they will not be clothed with the building. They will be what? Naked, asleep, or dead. Now some people say, Pastor, I don't like that, you know. We're, we're, we're going to be separated from the Lord and then until Jesus comes? Well, the dead people don't know it. For dead people, there's no separation. Because they're unconscious. For unconscious people, there's no passing of time. So let's take Adam, who died when he was 930 years ago. 930 years old. Over 5,000 years ago. When Jesus calls Adam from the grave and Adam resurrects, he says, how long has gone by? Oh, 5,000 some years. No. I just died an instant ago. You see, there's no passing of time for the dead person. A dead person can't be separated from the Lord because he doesn't know it. So for the dead person, the next thinking moment, he will be with the Lord in a certain sense. It's true that as soon as a person dies, they go to heaven. Now let me explain that and qualify it so that you don't misunderstand what I'm saying. From the perspective of the, de of the dead person, when that person died right now, the next thinking moment, he sees Jesus coming on the clouds. For him, no time passed. He goes to heaven immediately after his what? After his death, even though 5,000 years plus have passed for Adam. Are you with me? No separation. Now, what is the critical issue for the Apostle Paul? Now he's going to become practical in his theology. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 9. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be what? To be well-pleasing to him. He says, what's the key? Whether we're in the tent or later when we're in the building, what's the important thing? The important thing is to be what? To be pleasing to Him. Folks, this idea that man has an immortal soul that flies off to heaven at the moment of death is a legacy that the Christian church has received from Greek philosophy. 
The Christian church has not received this from the Bible. What they've done is they've received this from Greek philosophy and then they look for these texts and they inject this idea into Scripture because they're thinking like Greeks. They're not thinking like Hebrews, which deals with the unity of the person. There can be no, no separation between the soul and the body. Incidentally, the Bible makes it very clear that our only hope of life is not found in us in an immortal soul. It's found in Jesus Christ. So when you say that you have an immortal soul that even God can't destroy. See, they say that even the wicked are going to burn forever in the fires of hell because they have a soul that's immortal and God even God can't annihilate that soul because He gave that soul immortality. That's almost like saying that a person becomes God. See, immortality is an attribute that belongs only to God. It does not belong to man. By the way, later on we're going to talk about those passages, you know, where it speaks about man being destroyed with eternal fire and with everlasting destruction and so on. We're going to have a whole lecture where we'll deal with those passages and we're going to see that those passages are not teaching what people think they're teaching. Just like this one, people inject their personal views into the text. Our only hope of life, folks, is found in Jesus Christ. I want to read a couple of texts before we draw this to a close. Go with me to 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. Here the beloved disciple is categorical in what he says. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. And this life belongs to us. Is that what it says? No. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. Eternal life is contingent. It is derived. It is not inherent in man. And then, in case you didn't understand that this life is in His Son, John says, He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. In any way, shape, or form. No life in ourselves, outside of Jesus Christ. It was the devil who said, you will not surely die, but you shall be as God. Go with me to John 11, verses 25 and 26. This is a story of the resurrection of Lazarus. He'd been dead for four days. This is the greatest miracle of Jesus. Jesus comes to the tomb. Of course, Mary and Martha are crying. They say, we know that he'll resurrect in the final day, but we would like to have him alive now. Notice what Jesus says in verses 25 and 26 of John 11. Jesus said to her, to Mary, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. What does Jesus mean when he says, though he may die? It would mean that we would lay aside our what? The tent would dissolve. What did he mean when he say, though he die, yet shall he live? He means that immediately the person dies, then he has a new life coming up the soul out of, out of the body to heaven. Of course not. He's saying, I am the resurrection and the life. He's not talking about going to heaven after you die. He's saying, he's speaking about the resurrection. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And now notice, verse 26, and whoever lives 
and believes in me shall never die. Wait a minute, he just said that though he die, yet shall he live. So he says, whoever receives me will never die. What kind of death is he talking about when he says that he will never die? He's talking about the second death. He's talking about the death that really counts. You see, the first death doesn't count. For those who are in Christ, the dead in Christ, death is but a moment of silence. We don't have to fear death. We can go home and we can sleep well, not having to be concerned if we wake up the next morning or not, if we're in Christ. Because our life is hid in Him, according to Scripture. See, folks, we need to get it in our minds that our hope of life is not found in an immortal soul that leaves the body at the moment of death. The hope of life is found outside of ourselves in Jesus Christ. And Jesus has given us His Spirit as the guarantee. You can take it to the bank, is what Jesus is saying, because if the Spirit that raised up Jesus dwells in you, that Spirit that resurrected Him, that gave life to His mortal body, will give life to your mortal body as well. Amen. What a glorious hope Christians have. Amen. And yet it's ruined by the idea that when you die, the soul goes to heaven, and then when Jesus comes again, He brings the soul from heaven. We already dealt with that text. Brings the, brings the soul from heaven, and then He kind of joins it to the body. What an anticlimax. It's much more glorious to believe that the people who are in the grave, who are dead, who don't live, Jesus comes, He blows a trumpet, He calls them forth from the tomb, He says, I am the resurrection and the life, and those people come forth by a miracle of God with their building, incorruptible, immortal, to live forevermore with Jesus Christ. Amen. That glorifies Jesus. The first view is actually a glorification of man. The question is, have we received Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord? That's the key question. If we have, we have no reason to fear. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. But we must be absolutely certain this evening that Jesus is our Savior and our Lord.